Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. I'm the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. We're joined today in this video by members of the staff of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Our membership and admin coordinator, Kelly Ross, is hosting the call and coordinating this technology. Our music and religious growth and learning directors are here with readings. Several of us are present in the chat room running beside this service on Sunday morning. We also have lay pastoral care folks on call this morning. And so if you need someone to talk to in this time, reach out and we will get you in contact with one of them. We've been doing this, this new way of being together for a while now. And while times have become less uncertain, because indeed we know that we are doing this, it is still a time of anxiety and a time of possibility. We continue to learn a lot quickly about how to be a church together and apart. Much has changed in the last few months, but what has not changed is the vision that we share in this place. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. That is a big, big vision. And we know that creating a loving community begins with welcome. So whether this is your first time here or your 500th, if you have stumbled onto this YouTube video by accident, or if you are a longtime member who joins us every Sunday morning, if you came here hopeful or heartbroken, whatever your age, gender, skin color, whomever you love, you are welcome here with us. It is important that we share the warmth, love, and light of this place in the world. So our ask to you is simple. Do not keep this church, this community, a hidden gem. Invite people to come be a part of what we are doing here. We have this service on Sunday morning, Vespers on Zoom every Thursday night, interviews and daily updates on YouTube, meditation videos, online classes, connection groups for members, and music, always music. So join us and invite others to do so as well. As we enter into worship this morning, take a moment to center yourself wherever you are. Find a comfortable place in your body. Take a few deep breaths. And let us begin by lighting a flaming chalice, the symbol of our shared faith. And our chalice lighting words this morning come from Hannah Senish, who wrote, Blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. Blessed is the flame that burns in the heart's secret places. Blessed is the heart with strength to stop its beating for honor's sake. Blessed is the match consumed by the kindling flame. Inside us, we'll lead the way. Oh, 
Today we are modifying what we typically do at the end of our church year as a bridging service. And my son Milo has something to say about that. Needless to say, without our church home building, this looks a bit different this year. Each year when we do our bridging ceremony, I am reminded of how I myself went through the same rite of passage at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln many years ago with my mother, Beryl Oschenberg, leading the ceremony. How blessed we are to have such beautiful traditions that last generations. The following words come from her. Things change, we change, our lives never stand still. There's always something new and we're always moving from one thing to another, one age to another, one place to another, one home or school to another, one challenge to another. And we call these changes transitions. A significant life passage is occurring in the life of our senior high students. Too often in our busy lives, we rush to celebrate an event like graduation and neglect to pause long enough to note in a deeper way the transformation of a human life. As a church community, this is our time to bring forth the spiritual attention that a significant transition deserves. Each year when our Bridging Sunday comes around, we offer our high school graduates the opportunity to speak their truth in front of the congregation. A senior statement can take many forms. Some youth will come forward and will tell us how their involvement at our church has impacted their lives. Some will speak their gratitude while others may share their learnings. Some have plans to share with us and some confess to an unknown future. In each case, we serve as both witness to and celebrants of their transition to a new stage of life. Our recognition of high school graduates today is about honoring a passage in the lives of these unique human beings. And today, Nathaniel Herpel will present his statement through a video as he prepares to walk the bridge away from his involvement in our religious growth and learning program and over into adulthood. I invite you to listen to his words with both your ears and your hearts. Hello, I am Nathaniel Herpel and I am 18 years old. I've just graduated from Lincoln East and I'm looking forward to attending UNL's College of Business, just where I will study economics. I started going to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln when I was in a freshman in high school. My mom took me there and we came in during the summer so we heard a lot of interesting sermons, which just kept us coming back for more because it was very interesting. I, one distinct one was about aliens where they actually played Star Wars music. I, I enjoyed that one, that was fun. Um, then during the fall, I, we, I got to attend RGL where I got to meet so many great and nice kind people, including my teachers and fellow classmates of RGL, where we would talk about current issues and we would talk about how we, our opinions, how we would fix or what we would do about a certain issue if we had the power to do it, which was a great exercise of thought which I felt was a little lacking from school at the time. Um, and also church gave me uh, great uh, possibilities in other aspects of my life. I am a scout, originally Boy Scout, and I have been, had been working for almost a year on trying to get my Eagle, which is the highest rank in all of Scouts. And the church gave me the ability to come up with a plan to fix a problem, which was the uh, front uh, playground where all the preschoolers play. And the problem was that every time it rained, it came straight out of the uh, gutters, which would 
uh, drain the mulch away. It would take the mulch with it and there would be no mulch, which means it's either muddy or just plain not safe for children to play on. So I came up with an underground water drainage system, which would take the water out from, away from the going onto the mulch, but instead going under the mulch and out into the field where you can see a PVC pipe coming out of the ground and there might be water in it. And that day, I people not only from my Boy Scout troop, but people from the church, including Molly and Mike, came out and helped me with my Eagle Scout project, which made everything go so much smoother. And I cannot thank them enough for that. I also should thank my RGL teachers for giving me the space to speak my opinions and have a constructive conversation rather than uh, an argument like things seem to go to nowadays. And I'm and I need to thank everyone who has celebrated my very weird and unconventional graduation this year. Uh, thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you, Nathaniel, for sharing your words and your experience with us. Will you join me wherever you are in a spirit of prayer or meditation? These are words by the Reverend Jean Lloyd. As Unitarian Universalists, we each have a different relationship to the concepts of worship and prayer. However, it is not uncommon to name our joys and sorrows to each other and lay them at the altar of that which calls us forward in life, the spirit of life and love. And in times such as these, we may reflect or pray to that spirit. In this time of chaos, when so many are being lost or lives threatened, we weep for the tragedy that brings death to the doors of so many. We hold in our hearts the tens of thousands who have died, their families, and those who have recovered but with lasting injuries to body and soul. We pray for those who are grieving, having never had the chance to offer that last hug, that last kiss. We pray for those who grieve alone, isolated in their homes. We pray for those who cannot bury their dead. We pray for children who are missing their parents, for parents who are missing their children, and for the friends and families who are missing each other. We pray for our courageous siblings who are trying to shield us from harm, knowing they do so at great risk to themselves and their loved ones. We pray for those who have lost their jobs. We pray for those most vulnerable who by skin color, class, ability, gender, or circumstance have suffered unfairly because our society is so deeply flawed. We pray for everyone that has lost their world, meaning the world they knew before. It's routines, it's people, the institutions we may have trusted, the confidence we had in each other and ourselves, the optimism and trust we had once because we didn't fully understand the inequalities and misuse of power in our world. In these moments, as we grieve this dreaded monumental milestone, 100,000 dead, we seek stability, comfort, and sympathy from each other and ourselves. We seek understanding. We crave trusted sources of information. We pray for unity among our people so that together we may reduce the destruction of sacred life. And we pray for hope. Where will we find hope? We know this pandemic will be temporary. 
and may be too long for many, but the disease itself will not be permanent, though its outcomes will be. For now, we know better than ever that our relationships with one another are life-giving. We can feel in our minds and hearts and in our bones the collective value and comfort of friendship and community. And we know it will return in person once again. We know the value of science and objective information. We know now the value of leaders who speak the truth with wisdom and compassion. We pray that our leaders find the fortitude and character to lead our communities and the world toward health. We pray for that time when we will rise collectively and move forward with these convictions. And we will move forward to create a better outcome for all because we cannot let it be that those who have died have died in vain. We are marked by those who have died and will die. And by this mark, this shared terrible loss, our collective grieving, we must, we must make a better world for humanity. And so we pray for hope that rises up out of our losses, a hope that drives us to ensure that our dismantled and recreated society is built in such, as, in such a way as to sustain humanity a hope and trust in each other that rises as we learn these lessons the hard way and embrace the act of selflessly caring for each other. We pray that as a people, we have courage to change the systems that cradle our lives such that our people will not have died in vain. Amen. As this next hymn plays, please share in the chat box your name or the name of someone you are holding in joy or in sorrow. Or you may choose to hold those joys and sorrows in your heart knowing they are no less real for being unspoken. We are connected, though we are physically distant. Our next hymn is Though I May Speak With Bravest Fire. reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound from heaven, 
like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each, each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And when they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all of the people that are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How then can each of us understand them in our native languages? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and regions of Libya, bordering Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our languages, in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some of them asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered, saying, they must be full of new wine. We're in the midst of a threshold moment in our community, our country, and many of our individual lives. This time that we're in right now is a kind of liminal space. Liminal, not what it what is, not what it was, but not yet what it is becoming. If you look up liminal online or in that old sociology textbook that's gathering dust in the next room over, you'll see that the classic textbook example of liminal space is a graduation ceremony. In the midst of a commencement, the gathered participants are no longer students. They have left that identity behind, but they are not yet graduates. When they walk to their seats at the start of the ceremony, they have one kind of status. And when they cross the stage at the end of the ceremony, they have a different kind of status no longer who they were in some important way. One of the hard realities of 2020 is that our markers of liminal space are absent right now, or at least profoundly changed. Graduations have been happening differently. Weddings, and there's another liminal space, the midst of a wedding ceremony, when folks are gathered but not yet taken vows. Ordinations. Yesterday I attended the now Reverend Rebecca Gantz ordination on Zoom. All of these things have happened much differently this spring and early summer than they have before. And it is strange to tell somebody going through it for the first time that this is not the way it usually happens because for them, this is the first and only time it's happened. But in each of these things, weddings, ordinations, graduations, the ritual is merely a marker of a transformation that has already taken place. So something I say to couples at weddings often goes a bit like this. You're not really creating anything new here on the wedding day. Tomorrow you'll wake up and you'll be the same people that you were yesterday. Tomorrow you will still fight about the same things that you did before this ceremony. And you will still love the same things about each other. A wedding is not a moment of transformation. It is an external marker of a transformation that's already happened. The transformation is internal but we use communal ritual to mark it. When that ritual is changed and unfamiliar then, it can cause us to question the transformation. 
which brings us to Pentecost, which is today, this Sunday. In the Christian tradition, Easter is not the beginning of the church. In the story, Jesus dies, is resurrected, and then the disciples are left wondering what it means. They know that their world has changed profoundly and that they are no longer who they thought they were. But how it's changed, who they are now, is unclear. And then 50 days after Passover, hence Pentecost in Greek, a miracle happens. Tongues of fire appear over the disciples' heads and they begin to preach. And as they speak, they find that everyone around them understands, each in their own language. While the speakers are all Galilean, passing Egyptians, Parthians, Edomites, all can understand clearly. And in this moment of the story, barriers of fear and misunderstanding and anxiety drop away, and what is left is the spirit. And a few passers-by wondering out loud if perhaps there was wine involved. At Pentecost, the miracle is not the tongues of fire or the speaking in tongues. There, that, that's there to catch the reader's attention. The miracle is the transformation. Disciples become apostles, students finding the courage and the grounding to become teachers. And the miracle of Pentecost that makes that transformation possible is the presence of the Spirit, tangible and irresistible. We mark moments of transformation in our lives when the spirit is alive in new ways in our life. And by spirit, I don't mean the third person of the Christian Trinity. That's not where we all are theologically. But I do mean the, the spirit that that most revered of Unitarian commencement speakers, Ralph Waldo Emerson, knew well. And he said that within us is the soul of the whole the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. When it breaks through our intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through our will, it is virtue. When it flows through our affections, it is love. The last Sunday we sang, find a stillness but I wonder if you might hear it differently this week. Find a stillness, hold a stillness, let the stillness carry me. Find the silence, hold the silence, let the silence carry me. In the spirit, by the spirit, with the spirit, giving power, there I will find true harmony. in the Spirit, by the Spirit, with the Spirit, giving power. There are moments in our, our lives when we can join with the Spirit, where our lives intersect something transcendent, something generational, something that our parents have done, our grandparents have done, our children of, of birth or adoption will do someday. Marriages, ordinations, graduations, in each one of these, the spirit moves. We have rituals to point to these times, but the rituals merely point. The spirit transforms regardless of the ritual. Amen. A couple of announcements as we move to a close of our time together. Next week, you will receive your newsletter electronically. You don't want to miss a welcome from our new board president and results from the voting last Sunday. If you're not receiving the daily e-blast and monthly newsletter, you can sign up at the website, www.unitarianlincoln.org. The link is in the chat box. As we close today, think about giving a small contribution to the collection plate. 
just text UC Lincoln space and then mount to 73256. This is also in the chat box. One last piece regarding transformation and the spirit. Transformation is rarely easy and transformation is not always peaceful. It is impossible for me to write or speak about tongues of fire above the heads of the apostles and not think about the third police precinct in Minneapolis burning on Thursday night. It brings back memories for me of watching my adopted home of Baltimore on fire five years ago this spring after the death in police custody of Freddie Gray. That was a moment of transformation for me because I, I thought I knew Baltimore. I thought I understood what progress the city had made, the challenges that it still faced. I thought I understood what it meant for generational poverty in that place to be is inseparable from race. And the transformation for me five years ago was the realization that I do not, that I cannot fully understand that anger. I cannot understand the depth of hurt that systemic oppression creates. And the transformation for me in that year was the recognition that that system is everywhere. I had done ride-alongs with the Baltimore Police Department. I had officers I counted as friends who I knew were committed to justice in all its forms. And I saw that that was not enough in Baltimore. It is not enough in Minneapolis. It was not enough in Ferguson, and it's not enough in Lincoln. I say this because it's really tempting in this moment to say, my goodness, what's happening in Minneapolis is terrible, but Lincoln is different and protests should be peaceful anyway. Lincoln is not different. I've had good experiences every time I've interacted with the Lincoln Police Department, but that does not mean that everyone has. And fury is an appropriate response to a system that, that kills, that takes life, whether through police brutality or food deserts or lack of access to medical care in the midst of a pandemic. It's not my role to say a whole lot more than that. I'm a person of great privilege in this system. The answers are just not gonna come from somebody who looks and sounds like me. But I will be at the Black Lives Matter rally at the Capitol this afternoon in solidarity and in support. And I will pray in words and deeds today and every day that we transform the systems we create and live in until justice rolls down like the waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 1028 in the Teal Hymnal, The Fire of Commitment.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen.